We are so excited that you are joining us for our first virtual learning experience for the end of the school year. I am thrilled that you're going to be joining us with Tim Townsy soon, an outdoor educator, and he is going to be joining us on a series of hikes to learn about invasive species at Harper's Ferry, Antietam National Battlefield, and National Mall. So you are definitely in for a treat. My name is Dana Rubenstein from the Educational Technology Department, and we have a few housekeeping tips to get started before Tim comes on. So just a reminder that this session is recorded. So if you have colleagues in your building that can't join us right now, this is going to be added to our YouTube channel soon after the uh, live stream is over. And you can find that on this channel right after we're done. You can also follow us on Twitter at EdTechPBC, and you can Go ahead and tweet along with us if you'd like, and please go ahead and subscribe and like below so that you'll always be aware of what's coming up. As we go through today's live stream, go ahead and ask your questions in the chat. We have moderators in the chat that can answer your questions. So go ahead and type everything in there. And with that, I would like to go ahead and introduce Tim Towsey. He is going to be on a journey and you are in for a treat because he is going to be, he's been camping and exploring and this is gonna be phenomenal. So Tim, over to you. Thanks, Dana. Yeah, as Dana mentioned, um, we are going to be doing some exploring. And what I really try to do with this series of hikes or walks, because um, we're in Washington, D.C., and I don't know if that's a hike or a walk. We we try to draw this distinction and we said a hike is a lot like a walk, but there's more crying and hiking because they're longer and you're climbing more. Um, but anyway, these are these are kind of fun. We start out in Harper's Ferry. We actually are on in Maryland on the um on the Potomac River, and then we walk into Harper's Ferry across the bridge that used to be, um, well, it took the place of a ferry. Um, and we just kind of talk about some invasive plants and animals in historic places. Uh, and then we'll go over to Antietam National Battlefield, which was the site of the bloodiest battle uh, in the Civil War. And it's active farmland. So it's kind of difficult to distinguish the well, what's planted versus invasives, and sometimes they're the same thing. We'll kind of get a little bit into that. Um, and then we'll end up in the National Mall, which is in an urban environment where you see a blending of the urban and, well, the natural. Um, and then sometimes those lines get really fuzzy, and that's the, 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 fun, the fun exploration of these. Um, before we jump in, let's talk a little bit about what invasive species are. So a native species is a species that exists, either plant or animal, um, that exists in an area. Um, and an exotic species is one that is brought in from another place, and it might be there, kind of like a pet or something. Um, and then, you know, it, it doesn't really spread. Invasives are animals and plants that are brought from other areas that spread and eventually take over. And that's why you know they're invading. Um, some of the stuff that we look at uh, is is going to be like naturally there, and then we talk about the invasives and how they got there. Uh, and then when we get to Washington D.C., those are mostly exotics, which is kind of fun. But there are some invasive ones in there. Um, so I guess without further ado, let's let's go to let's go to Harper's Ferry. Let's go hang out on the Potomac River for a little bit, which is in hey, Maryland friends. and West Virginia. Uh, Tim Towsley here, and. We've been talking about different places and different things, and they just happen to all be along the Appalachian Trail, which is where I'm standing right now. Uh, it's actually the Appalachian Trail and the CNO towpath, 
which is a big rail trail often used by cyclists, but you can hike it as well because it is part of the Appalachian Trail. Uh, and we're here on the banks of the Potomac River uh, on the Maryland side. We are going to cross that bridge that's behind me uh, into West Virginia, specifically into Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, which has a long history. At Harper's Ferry, this was the site of the armory that General George Washington set up in the very, very early 19th century. Um, and there was also a big uprising here uh, led by John Brown, who was an abolitionist. This was before the Civil War, um, but it's one of the incidents that led to the, the Civil War and eventually the end of slavery. But, well, we're going to cross the bridge into West Virginia. Um, now, this bridge was not here during uh, that time. In fact, this, is, this town is called Harper's Ferry because of Robert Harper, who ran, guess what, a ferry service across the Potomac River connecting West Virginia and Maryland. So on the other side of that river, we're going to visit some parts of Harper's Ferry, the town itself. We're going to see some things about John Brown. But really what we're here for in this whole experience is to look at invasive plant and animal species with an emphasis on the plant species. So on the other side of that bridge uh, is my friend Ryan Tijan, um, and I'll introduce him in a bit, but he is an expert on invasive plant species. We are still on the Appalachian Trail, which is kind of cool. These steps were definitely not made with naturally occurring materials. <clears throat> there you can see a much better view of Harper's Ferry. Also a whole bunch of tourists. So graffiti. So humans as invasive species. So I mentioned that John Brown was an abolitionist who led the raid on Harper's Ferry to overtake the armory, which was up that away. Uh, but this was the firehouse in Harper's Ferry. Uh, but this is actually where the raid ended. Um, I mentioned that he had armed. Uh, he, he had armed enslaved peoples, uh, and sadly, most of those people in the raid um, either perished during the raid, were killed immediately afterward on site, and John Brown himself was tried and executed for, for inciting the rebellion. Um, and there's a very famous song called John Brown's Body that you may know the tune of if you look it up. So here on the grounds of the armory, um, they call this the six acres that changed the world. And I mentioned that the raid at Harper's Ferry was not a battle in the Civil War, it was actually before the Civil War. Um, but what it did was it then called attention to uh, slavery and the abolitionist movement uh, with John Brown and his people. Um, and that is why the uh, John Brown's raid uh, is connected to the Civil War um, and why a lot of people now believe that the Civil War was a war to end slavery. Pretty, pretty important place we're standing on. Ryan, how's it going? Hey Tim, how you doing? Doing okay. This is a beautiful day. Yeah. Some beautiful history, beautiful nature, and some beautiful but not so kind invasive plants, right? That's oh, what we're yeah. here to talk about. So tell us who you are and uh, what you know about plants. Yeah, my name is Ryan. I work for the Bureau of Land Management. It's a, a federal agency within the Department of the Interior. And before that, I was at the exotic plant management team for the National Park Service. So I know a lot about uh, all the invasive plants around the DC metro area. There's plenty here in Harper's Ferry. We'll see plenty at Antietam. And we'll talk a little bit about them at the National Mall. That's awesome. So what's your favorite invasive species? 
Well, I have a lot of least favorites. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I made a joke as I was walking over from uh, West Virginia or uh, Maryland over there. Uh, I made a joke about all the locks on the bridge mm -hmm. and the points and some graffiti too. And I wanted to point out that humans can be invasive species. Oh, yeah. um, what would, would you say so? Yeah, they're, they're uh, part of the reason why we have a lot of the invasive plants we have. You know, a okay. lot of people are planting plants that they didn't either they didn't know were invasive or, or did and thought they were pretty. And then critters, birds eat those plants, eat those berries and distribute them along with uh, people hiking and walking and many, many different ways these plants are distributed mostly by humans. That's super cool, but what I'm hearing you say, you mentioned that you had a lot of least favorite invasive species. I don't know if people are your favorite or your least favorite, but I think given what you've told me, would you say that people are the best invasive species? We're like the best at in being invasive. Oh yeah, we are the best at being invasive for sure. Cool. You can see here we have a more mature tree of heaven that invasive tree that smells like rotten peanut butter. And then we also have it mixed in with a bunch of wine berry, right? So this is a thorny, spiky bramble that uh, tastes really good, but you can see here, spreading. Very cool. Um, so does the, the wine berry grow Coca-Cola cans? Sometimes they do. Uh, that looks like trash trash, not historical trash. I think I might pack that out. Although Harper's Ferry is a trashless park, which really just means they have no trash cans. Uh, and people are invasive species, so they're going to drop trash wherever they can. Yep. Uh, I picked them up, Ryan. Uh, these are have a production date of December 6th, 2021. Definitely not historical trash. Nope, it probably now, would have been if you left them there, though. All right, we found some more invasive plants. Here we have English ivy growing up this tree. It starts as a ground plant. Usually you can see over here that uh, there's a big patch of it and it's usually planted as an ornamental. And um, since it's a vining plant, it likes to climb, right? And so at some point, the vine climbs up the tree, wraps around it. And eventually if this doesn't get treated at some point, has the possibility to kill the tree. You can also see here, there's a lot of different berries on each end of this plant. So can you just imagine how much bird food that is? And so birds will eat those seeds. Again, eat the seeds and uh, dis distribute them by pooping. And so if you look around the Washington metro area, you'll see a lot of English ivy and um, just a pretty nasty invasive plant, mostly spread by bird poop and people planting them in their house or former houses, stuff like that. Got it. So note, do not plant English ivy, no matter how pretty it looks. Yeah, I, w I would agree with that. Great. Yeah, so uh, we can see here an example of how this invasive English ivy can take down trees, right? This was a pretty small tree but you can see how wrapped around the ivy is along the tree. And at some point, it just toppled over. And this is the result. So wild. So in case you couldn't tell, Harper's Ferry is, or at least was, a major railroad town. And I think when we were talking at uh, Shenandoah and the Great Smokies Mountain and National Park, we talked about repurposing natural resources. Well, in this case, uh, this particular diner is built out of upcycled train cars. So they're reusing the resources that were once here for different purposes so they can still be useful, which is a really great practice in sustainability. You're muted, Tim. Got it. There we go. <laughs> Trying not to impede with the wind sound uh, on, on on videos. <laughs> um, but as you can see, uh, Harper's Ferry has you know it's a, it is a thriving little mountain town in West Virginia that's right across the Virginia border. Um, but there is all this like historical stuff there, um, and as you can see, all of the all of the plants. Um, 
there's a little bit more uh, to Harper's Ferry, but um, do we have any any questions that have come through? Hi, Tim. Hey. No questions quite yet. Okay, great. Maybe maybe they're they're just brewing. So let them brew and and ask away when they come. Thanks. You can show the next part now. All right, we found some more invasive plants. Here we have English ivy growing up this tree. It starts as a ground plant. Usually you can see over here that uh, there's a big patch of it. And it's usually planted as an ornamental. And uh, since it's a vining plant, it likes to climb, right? And so at some point, the vine climbs up the tree, wraps around it. And eventually, if this doesn't get treated at some point, has a possibility to kill the tree. You can also see here, there's a lot of different berries on each end of this plant. So can you just imagine how much bird food that is? And so birds will eat those seeds. Again, eat the seeds and uh, dis distribute them by pooping. And so if you look around the Washington metro area, you'll see a lot of English ivy and um, just a pretty nasty invasive plant, mostly spread by bird poop and people planting them in their house or former houses, stuff like that. Got it. So note, do not plant English ivy no matter how pretty it looks. Yeah, I, w I would agree with that. Great. Yeah, so uh, we can see here an example of how this invasive English ivy can take down trees, right? This was a pretty small tree, but you can see how wrapped around the ivy is along the tree. And at some point, it just toppled over. Which is a really great practice in sustainability. So we're here at the Antietam battlefield, um, which is the site of the bloodiest single day battle in the Civil War. And it's also where Clara Barton was, who is the founder of the American Red Cross, was noted as the angel of the battlefield for providing bandages and medical care to the soldiers on both the Union and um, Confederacy. So it's a pretty, pretty wide expanse of battlefield. But uh, one of the interesting things about this battlefield is that, and this battle in particular, is that most of it was fought in the woods surrounding the battlefield. All right, we're here in the west woods of Antietam, and we're talking about invasive plants, and we found a whole bunch of garlic mustard seedlings. These plants here, you can see that these seedlings are starting to take over and that's what we're talking about when we talk about invasive plants right they start to take over an area it's a, a whole monoculture of the same plant and then you start to lose biodiversity within um, the ecosystem you know there's a invasive plants love disturbance and they love to take over and you can see that there's a bunch of disturbance here and if you start to look around, you can start to notice all of the different garlic mustard seedlings within this area. And we have found some more. Uh, the infamous Japanese honeysuckle plant. You can see here it's starting to bloom out in early spring. It's coming from a vine down here. So if you trace it down, you can find the literally the root of the plant and the root of the problem. And uh, these just cause a real big thicket. They uh, spread, they um, reduce biodiversity, create monocultures. You can see here, uh, somebody has um, identified this old uh, Japanese honeysuckle. You can see it's dying. And the reason it's dying is because somebody cut the root of the problem right here. So they went in, used some sort of gardening tool, cut it down, and now you can see it's dying on the vine. And that's really how this park is getting uh, reducing some of the invasive plants. You can also see over here that this is called a bush honeysuckle plant. So I'm not sure if it's in the same family or not, but it's a common name, honeysuckle. Um, they're more tree-like, and you can see that uh, 
it's a pretty big one here been growing for a while and what people do to get rid of these is to use usually saw them down and then spray herbicide on the trunk wild what about this uh, thorny boy here well this is a native plant or native tree excuse me uh, this is called a honey locust tree you can see big spikes within that the antietam like, sure does love honey huh yep a lot, okay. of, a lot of honey suckles honeys yeah unfortunately i don't think you can get honey from the tree oh it's a bummer get some th thorny honey yep. for your for your spicy tea and then again uh if you come over here you can see that monoculture base of the garlic mustard that we talked about earlier looks like a very disturbed area right some yeah. sort of tree thinning or cutting and uh produces millions of seeds and they really like that disturbance and it'll, it'll just come in here and really take over so you've talked about monocultures twice in the past like couple minutes um what is monoculture and why is it bad because i'm sensing negative connotation so why why is yeah. that i mean i think thing? it's okay when you're producing crops and things right they talk about monocultures with corn and things like that but when you're trying to enhance biodiversity what you don't want is a single culture of something, right? What mono means one. So you really want to be able to have something that's diverse uh, within an ecosystem. And when invasive plants are introduced, they, they have no predators, right? And so they really can start to take over an area. So without any treatments or anything, this whole field could potentially become a field of garlic mustard. Over, you see all the leafed out plants in here? That's all bush honeysuckle. So you can start to see where um, something like that will easily take over a forest if you don't maintain it. But if we look on the ground here, we see another invasive plant called periwinkle. Uh, a lot of periwinkle sites are old homesteads or old home sites. You'll see this a lot with um, house, you know, housing ruins, stuff like that. Uh, viney plant very hard to get rid of because it has a waxy leaf and low to the ground um, very intensive work to get rid of some, something like that and then if we keep walking down more bush honeysuckle and then you can see these kind of arching briars this is called wineberry so another invasive plant the berries are very tasty another uh Another invasive plant here, this is called Tree of Heaven. You can see kind of the, the sprouting of all these little, um, little trees, pretty much. They probably all came from one tree that was cut down. So when that happens, it kind of shoots up new, new sprouts. Another invasive plant we found here, this is uh, kind of the, the, the sprouting of uh, what they call Let's, sorry. It's all good. It's all good. I can edit that too. Yeah. You can just say sprouting it. Another, uh, another invasive plant here. This is called Tree of Heaven. You can see kind of the the sprouting of all these little, um, little trees, pretty much. They probably all came from one tree that was cut down. So when that happens, it kind of shoots up new, new sprouts. Uh, pretty invasive plant, as you can tell becomes uh, just one type of one type of system here um, really hard to get rid of and smells like rotten peanut butter that's disgusting yeah it's disgusting it might taste good with some garlic mustard though oh yeah we could just have a salad out here if you want yeah some wine berries yeah let's let's uh, let's do that uh, off camera sounds good I mean not do it at all so it seems like now that you've mentioned all of these invasive plants, I'm seeing more of those than what was probably here during the battles. So why, why, why do you think, like, why is that? I mean, I know they spread, but what's the, what's the dilemma? Why doesn't the park just like cut them all out? Well, you can see that that requires a lot of work, right? Yeah. And so I think there, the park is, has to be selective on the areas that they want to restore and removing invasive plants is really just the first step, right? certainly have to get rid of the invasive plants, but you have to have a plan to be able to restore that area too. So that usually means reseeding with native plants, coming back, monitoring, making sure that no more invasives have come in. Uh, so it's really a lot of care and feeding for yeah. 
for nature to really get back to where where it's supposed to be. Right. So it seems like if they, you know, went really hard on the invasives, they would end up a attacking the natural like native plants as well. And, you know, it, it seems like a, a dilemma. And I imagine it's one that you always have to face in, in this kind of environment where you want to get rid of the invasives, but protect the 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 natural resources that are here as well and it seems like it's hard to do one without the other you know yeah and you know that's where learning comes into play right Ident being able to identify different types of species of plants and, um, making sure that you're treating the right plant you don't want to go and kill a native vine like a grapevine misidentify it because then you're kind of removing something that's supposed to be there so it really takes knowledge and learning and uh, learning about plants which is fun and learning about scientific names and the characteristics of plants um, so it's a really a, a skill that you need to learn to be able to do this type of work i love it sorry about the editing mishaps there friends uh, not really a video editor i know about trees and plants um, i see uh, a couple of questions in the chat and i want to touch on a couple of those so the locks on the bridge that was a a really kind of interesting um phenomenon and it doesn't it doesn't exist just at harper's ferry but a lot of times when you know couples are dating or they're in love or they're getting married they will put a lock with their initials somewhere in public and you, you see it a lot of times over um over big bridges like that um there are some places where they've become such a problem that they're actually pulling down some of the, the fencing or the guardrails and things. Um, so the park service will come through and actually cut all those locks off. You'll see that at Harper's Ferry too. They will cut all those locks off eventually um, just because they, well, first they leave something that's like, it might be kind of nice for you, but that does that have meaning for, for everybody? You know, it's sort of like graffiti. That might be something that's important for you, but does that have meaning for everybody that's there? And if you can think back to those leave no trace principles of be considerate of other visitors, like in the picture that we see on your screen, look at that beautiful scenery behind, you know, you've got this, the Potomac River, you've got, you know, these trees that are growing, you've got the hills and the mountains and all that. Do we want that to be impeded by, you know, the, the locks and the, and the graffiti that's there? Um, so it, it's it's unsightly, but it can also have some structural damage. Um, and I think there's a there's a bridge in Amsterdam that had so many locks on it that it like the wall of it. It had like a wall and like a little, little rooftop that was like uh, chain link fence. People put so many locks on it that it just fell over. Um, and so that can be that can be very very problematic. Um, there was another question in there about why are invasives so bad, um, and that's a, I think is a is a really good question. Um, so let's talk about the tree of heaven because there's another question about the tree of heaven that's there. So the tree of heaven, it grows really, really quickly, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's not native to that area. So what happens when the tree of heaven, like Ryan mentioned, a big tree fell over um, and it had all of these little sprouts. Well, what will happen is all of those sprouts are going to grow to be very, very, very large. Um, we showed the, the, the tree of heaven at Harper's Ferry. We actually filmed these in reverse. Uh, you Hopefully you won't pick up on that. But we did Antietam before Harper's Ferry, and we didn't find any full-grown tree of heaven at Harper's Ferry or at Antietam because they had like nipped them in the bud or at the root and removed the big ones. Um, but we did see some at Harper's Ferry. So if you kind of like jump back and forth in the videos, you'll see those. But those little sprouts will eventually get really, really big. Um, but the tree of heaven, one of the things that's interesting about it is it gets really, really big on the above ground part, but it gets really, really massive underground. And what happens is those root structures will actually um, choke out other native plants and, and trees that are there. And it'll make it so that those trees can't thrive and those will die and they'll be completely replaced by um, these invasive, you know, lantern moths or uh, invasive tree of heaven. The reason I mentioned the lantern moths is one of the interesting things is, you know, sometimes there's this symbiotic relationship relationship uh, between animals and in nature and um the lantern moths they like to live in the tree of heaven so lantern moths are really really invasive insect you might have seen some videos um online or or warnings um it's more up here in my area uh, and a little bit north like in pennsylvania and new york but what's happening is these lantern moths are going into these plants and trees and they're they live off they live off of the sap that's in those 
um, that's in those, you know, plants. And when they, when they distribute that, um, you know how Ryan mentioned that a lot of these invasives are spread through bird droppings? Well, the lantern moths will suck all of that sap and then they will actually leave droppings. But what happens is those seeds not only get planted, they carry with them a, um, it's like a harmful like fungus that's like part of the waste product of the lantern moths that will can actually kill out entire crops. It can kill out, you know, forests. Um, it could be very, very, very bad. Um, so some invasive plants are okay. You know, they're nice to look at and, you know, they're, they're decorative. But what the problem is, is when they spread much, much farther. And like with Tree of Heaven and English Ivy, um, the South is full of kudzu. Kudzu is one of these where the vine that ate the South is what people had planted it, but it has spread. You know, a lot of times along the highway, I've seen down in Florida, Georgia, um, South Carolina, in those areas, you'll see, you know, trees and whole things that are just gobbled up by this kudzu vine. Um, that can be very problematic because it kills the native species. It's very, very difficult to work with because I feel like as soon as you cut all that stuff down, there's more that you miss that you didn't see that just pop up right away. Um, and it gets to be this, you know, never ending battle of the, the invasives versus the natural. Um, so for the question about the, the tree of heaven sprouts, do we cut those down? Um, I would definitely cut those down. Uh, get rid of them as, as, as quickly as we can um, so that they don't turn into those trees. Um, also kind of good luck because there's so many of them and they grow so, so quickly that as you can see in that little uh, clip there, the park service is going to come in and take care of those. They're going to get rid of all of them, but they can't really even stay on top of it. They're just there. They have to try to manage it to keep it from spreading farther. You know, it was one of the things that Antietam is it is actually natural farmland. Um, and it's still farmland. It was farmland when the, the battles were happening there and it's still active farms now. So if you're trying to grow crops and then you have all these tree of heaven kind of taking over everything, well, that's very problematic for the farmer that's trying to live off of that, you know, that growth if it's being drowned out by other plants that, well, <laughs> you can't sell at a market. Do we see any others? Okay. If not, we can hop into the National Mall. So we're in a totally different environment today. Uh, we came out to the National Mall, which is, well, there's the Washington Monument right behind me. The Lincoln Memorial is kind of back there too. You can sort of see it. Um, the National Mall runs from the Lincoln Memorial all the way to the U.S. Capitol Building. Uh, and in between are all of the Smithsonian Museums. But yesterday we talked about invasive species. Today we're going to talk about non-native and exotic species and how, you know, different invasives and different wildlife management happens in an urban environment. One thing that a lot of people don't know is that the National Mall is actually managed by the National Park Service. So while this isn't a national park, it is under the same jurisdiction and management of you know the other parks we visited, like Great Smoky and Shenandoah. You have to think about the kinds of impact that a place like this would have. There's literally tens of thousands of people here every day, hundreds of thousands of people in the summer you know and it's all for for this kind of stuff right that guy you've seen him um and then like that guy over there the building the buildings have things happen there but this is really just a monument you know um and and lots of people want to come here to see it um i don't blame them it's you know history and all that um but think about the the impact that that has on these natural areas it's pretty it's pretty intense so behind me is the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, you might recognize it from your pennies. Uh, it's also the spot where Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech in August of 1963. But we're not really here to talk about what's happening above ground at the Lincoln Memorial. We want to talk about what's happening underground. Brian, can you tell us about what's under the Lincoln Memorial? Yeah, so there's actually a cave under the Lincoln Memorial where there is our stalactites and stalagmites growing, and they're now turning that into a visitor center. Very cool. Uh, so how does this pertain to invasive species? Well, to start with the visitor center, you had to get rid of all of the rats, and rats are pretty invasive here in DC. So they have something called IPM, which is Integrated Pest Management, 
where they go in, we trap all the rats to clear them out before they start to build the visitor center. Cool. So where did they send them? I'm not sure. Did they send them to like a farm to live out their lives peacefully? Nope. Ah, oh, bummer. <laughs> so check this guy out. This one is kind of kind of busted. And I was thinking that it might be some invasive species that caused all of this, but I think it's just weight and rot. Because we can look right in that and see right through that tree. That happens sometimes. Let's come around the other side and see what we can check out there. Oh yeah. This one has actually been burned. So remember what I was saying about people being invasive species? That is 100% what that is. So here this is, it's still alive, but it's severely damaged. And that was caused by people. Or lightning, I guess, but probably people. So we're standing here on the banks of the Potomac River. Uh, you can see the 14th Street Bridge over there. And we have another kind of cherry tree. What is this cherry tree, Ryan? It's called a weeping cherry tree. Yeah? Why is it called a weeping cherry tree? Because if you see, you can tell that the branches are hanging down low. So, so they say that type of tree is weeping. Just like the probably more familiar weeping willow. Yeah. So we know that the cherry trees are exotic. They're not necessarily invasive, so they're not native but they're not invasive because they don't spread outside of this area. Um, do they, or have they over time, cross-pollinated with the weeping willow? Could, that, could this actually be a native cherry tree? I don't think, that's a good question, but I don't think so. You know, there's something called grafting where they merge two types of trees together, and we may see that uh, further down the line here, but there's, not something, there's no cross-pollination of the trees. Uh, there's just different species of trees on the mall. Not all of them are the same. And they were brought over here uh, by, by the Japanese as, as a peace offering in, I think, 1912. Wow. So they've been around a long time, like over 100 years, but not forever. Right. right? So some of the trees around here are much, much older than the cherries, but the cherries are kind of dominant in the area. Yeah, and you, you never know with climate change happening, you know, in 100 years or 200 years, these trees may become invasive. That's how some of this stuff starts. Very cool. So I guess the weeping cherry is just weeping because it's sad. It's a rainy day today, so that's probably why it's happening. Yeah, makes sense. So Ryan, what's going on with this tree here with the metal cage around it? Well, this is a younger cherry tree. And back in the 1990s, there was a problem with beavers chopping down these cherry trees. So uh, they had to come up with a solution that wouldn't harm the beaver, but also protect the tree. And what they came up with was putting cages around the trees till they reach a certain age. So that protects the tree and it doesn't harm the beavers. Or there's different species of cherry trees along the mall. And some of them are in bloom right now. And some of them will be probably be budding and in bloom in the next week or two. Man, these are some, some cool trees. Mm -hmm. It's a water cactus. Water cactus? Mm -hmm. Are those native? No. Nope. No. But are they invasive? No, they're exotic. They're exotic, okay. And they don't they probably don't spread. Nope. No, not at all. I don't even see any buds. So down there by the water, we're going by the rule of thumb, uh, we can see some Canada geese. Now I, I might be mistaken here, but aren't Canada geese invasive? Well, they certainly come from Canada. It might be a migratory bird, so I'm not sure if they're invasive or not. I do know that Canadian geese have one partner for their whole life. So you can see those two are probably dating or married. That's amazing. Romance. So while the Canada geese might not be native to this area, uh, I know for a fact that maple trees are not native to this area either. These, like the cherry trees, were a gift. What kind of gift was this? Yeah, so these are maple trees that were a gift from the Canadian government in 2017. There's 150 of them in here, representing the 150 year anniversary of their partnership. So how is a maple tree different from a cherry tree? It's a good question. 
or different species of trees. So there's a lot of different species of trees in the world. And, you know, not all of them are native to where they're planted. It's the uh, trees usually do well in certain climates. And a maple tree and a cherry tree, they can both survive well in this type of climate. So how long before we can tap this tree and get some pancake syrup? Well, we are on federal property. And I don't think that can happen to date. Ooh, what would happen if we were to tap this tree or otherwise damage it on federal property? I think you'd probably get fined. It's a big fine too, isn't it? I bet. I don't want to find out. So Ryan, a couple of minutes ago, you gave us a very specific date as to when the peak bloom of the cherry blossoms is. How do we know that? Yeah, so across the tidal basin next to the Jefferson Memorial is something called the indicator tree. And that's where the National Park Service monitors a specific tree over there that blooms one to two weeks earlier than all the other trees around here. So they monitor that tree, identify when the buds come out and predict the day for peak bloom. So this year, they're predicting peak bloom is March 22nd, but since it's nature, you never know if it's gonna be the 23rd or the 21st or the 20th or further beyond that too. So in the neighborhood? The neighborhood. Of, of the 22nd. So where we're standing, this is the site of the very first cherry trees planted in Washington, D.C., uh, who, which were a gift to Washington, D.C. from uh, the Japanese. And as Ryan mentioned, they were in 1912. Uh, but here we get a specific date. The first ones were planted on March 27th, 1912. So this is a really cool tree. Uh, it's not a cherry, um, but it is growing really interestingly. Um, and this was most likely caused by the weight of the tree and some damage to the root structure because of all of this infrastructure built around the natural tree. See, that tree is old. It's been here for a very, very long time. Um, and this stuff is pretty old too, but when we're talking in terms of tree years, uh, this stuff is really new. That tree is, is not new. Um, but you can also see that they've built some infrastructure to keep this tree, which is still alive, uh, to keep it alive and to keep it standing there, even though uh, without that structure, this tree would most likely have fallen over and uh, not been something cool to look at. And well, this is going to conclude our visit here to Washington, D.C., where I think you can see a nice mix of the urban and the natural, along with the historical. And if you think about it, you know, people are animals. I've been a little bit cynical about people as invasive species, but these are just our habitats where we gather in large numbers and build the stuff we need. This is the escalator. We're going down. Do you think we can get to the cave? This is the way. Great. I'm so excited. Unfortunately, you can't get to the caves yet, yet. Um, it is actually a cavern and not a cave as I learned after we filmed this. Uh, the difference is a cave would be a naturally occurring, you know, structure, uh, but a cavern was built there. And the reason that it was built is um, I put an article in the resources that we'll share uh, in just a little bit, um, but there's an article in there about uh, the, the, it's called the Undercroft. And what that is, is a big cavern that was kind of there, but they put up all of these big pillars to hold the structure of the Lincoln Memorial. Because if you notice how the ground is over there, it's right by that river in that tidal basin and like uh, where the, where the, well, the river is the Potomac River. It's very marshy there. So if you have this gigantic, you know, building that is cut from stone and you put it into a marsh, it's going to sink. So they built this structure underneath to pre prevent it from sinking, um, but it also became a habitat for, for all kinds of things. Um, now, here's the cool part. They are turning that into a visitor center and a little bit of a, a museum, and they're going to leave a lot of that, that old structure there so you can actually go down and look at it. Um, but that, that hasn't happened yet. Um, it was supposed to open for the centennial anniversary of the Lincoln Memorial, um, but 
COVID kind of got in the way of that. So they're still they're still working on that now. Um, but there were lots and lots and lots of rats that lived down there. It created this wonderful ecosystem for them, and they would kind of like spread from there. So rats would be would be invasive. Um, there is no way to get into the cave from the Lincoln Memorial. There was some stuff that I cut out of the video where we talked about going exploring. And that thing at the end was just sort of a riff on that other stuff because I wanted to leave a little bit of it in because I thought it was so interesting and funny. Um, there's a question about the the rock formations uh, in, in the cave. Um, so those are, are stalactites and stalagmites. Um, and those are formed from water that are dripping through um, different parts of stone and different sorts of, of earth and other geological structures. But the water will drip and slowly over time, it will, will calcify um, and it'll kind of create like this stone-like structure. Some of them are very, very strong. Most of them are very fragile, but they, they, they form over many, 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 many years. We can't even fathom how long it takes because we don't we haven't been around that long. It's thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years. And eventually they'll meet and they'll make this big column, um, usually out of calcium or calcite or or other kinds of minerals that the the water will leach out. Um, and the joke, the joke that I heard, the way to tell the difference is, you know, between a stalactite and a stalagmite is that the stalagmite comes down and it eventually might reach the stalactite. Uh, that, that's going there. But those are natural. You can see those in almost all cave systems will we'll have them. Um, they're really, really cool. Uh, I encourage you to do some exploring and find them. There's lots. Uh, there was another question about, let me see. Um, oh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the very different environments there. There was so much going on that we filmed, we filmed probably an hour and a half worth of footage. Um, and we had to cut a lot of it out. And some of it was really, really good. And we tried to replicate it here, but we had these environmental sounds that really disrupted our, our chat. So we have an airport right across the river, Reagan International Airport, very, very busy airport. There were planes flying over about every, you know, minute or so um and then also there was that the beginnings of that police chase that happened that was pretty exciting um i'm sorry i couldn't put the whole chase on there for you it would have taken way too long um, but i did want to talk a little bit about the beavers um the beaver th that activity is still happening um and you know we mentioned that if if people had harmed any of those trees we would have been given a very very big fine for damaging stuff on natural on on federal property but the beavers they just have to try to kind of control them um and one of the things that the the community surrounding the cherry blossoms has sort of embraced and they were just getting ready for this big annual festival which is the cherry blossom festival um they've embraced it and one of the mascots of the cherry blossom um uh, festival is is a is a beaver and his name i think is oh it's either tails or flappy or something because of his tail um and i find that kind of interesting that they're sort of embracing that that real part of um you know that environment i think those are are there any other questions very cool right so um you can see on the screen there there is a link to a bitly um, which is just resources that talk all about the things that we mentioned there. There's some stuff from the National Park Service website. I put a couple of articles that I think would be friendly for, for you know, any group. There's this thing from Atlas Obscura that's about the undercroft of the Lincoln Memorial. You can learn a lot more about that. There's actually some graffiti down there that was from the workers who built that. They would draw like little cartoons and things. I think the the popular character from that time were the newspapers. It was, it was Mutt and Jeff, where they were called. Um, but the the Park Service has encased those in plexiglass so that those will be there when the visitor center opens, which I think is is pretty awesome. Um, but this Bitly link, just remember that those are case sensitive. Um, I encourage you to check it out. And uh, I don't know. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Tim. It's so interesting to learn how. The invasive plants and the insects, you mentioned those lantern moths and how everything is so interconnected and this, our ecosystem and how one thing affects another. And it's just fascinating. So I'd like to ask on behalf of our students, we, we noticed in the videos that you went from one location to another. Can you share for a moment 
about how you go camping. I know how how sure. many days did you spend? Because I that that's interesting to our students as well. Great. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. So I mentioned that all those things were along the Appalachian Trail. And I think that that is actually the geographical thread that ties the, the virtual learning experiences that I've done for you guys, is that all of them have the Appalachian Trail in them somehow. Um, and there was a part that unfortunately I had to cut because it was a little it was a little boring, but the actual, the headquarters of the Appalachian Trail is in Harper's Ferry because um, it is the exact midway point between Springer Mountain in Georgia and Katahdin Mountain in Maine. So they have their, their headquarters there. There's not a lot to look at. There was like one relief of the whole thing. Um, but for this one, you know, you can actually hike from the Pennsylvania line all the way through Maryland and through West Virginia into Virginia, all in the span in the expanse of about 30 miles. It's really not that far. It's where these states just all come, you know, closely together. Um, so yeah, there are places where you can hike along the Appalachian Trail along these places. When you get to the more urban environments, like the CNO Canal, which overlaps with the Appalachian Trail as we crossed that bridge, um, there are a lot of places that there are little hostels, uh, which is like a little uh, cheap hotel like living space where, where hikers can stay there um, cyclists can stay there there's fancy bed and breakfasts but there's also dispersed camping all along the way where you can set up a tent and just sort of like take your time you know going through all these spaces and that's something that that i really like to do i did not camp in washington dc however there are there is camping that is on that metro line it's in maryland um, but you can camp there and then go spend as much time as you want exploring the city um, by train, um, which is just it's a fascinating. Lot, a lot of ways to get around. And, and I'm always a big advocate for travel and exploring new places because I think that, you know, we learn so much more about how the world works by visiting other places um, and, and just going to check out things that that are just different from from where we live, um, which is why I really wanted to share a lot of this stuff with you. Yes, and that's why we love having you, Tim, because we learn so much as our students are in South Florida and you explore another part of the country and our students really learn just from you having these virtual learning experiences. And we're so happy to bring this to the students of Palm Beach County. So on that note, we are going to wrap things up and we have more exciting virtual learning experiences to bring to you. So please join us today at one o'clock for Loggerhead Marine Life Center. For that one, we're gonna be learning about sea turtle biology and sea turtle nesting season and the ocean threats and how at Loggerhead Marine Life Center, how they rehabilitate the sea turtles. So that's gonna be exciting. You'll join at this same YouTube channel. And then tomorrow at 10 a.m., please join us. We're going to be live from Norton Museum of Art and we are going to be spending time virtually with Taiwan and Stacy. This is artwork by American artist, John Ahern. And again, you can find all of those links at our edtechtraining.palmbeachschools.org. And you'll see the calendar there with the links that you need. We are so excited to bring these to you. Everything will be recorded as well, and you can find that on our YouTube channel. On behalf of the Educational Technology Department, thank you for joining us. We hope that you continue to enjoy our learning experiences. Have a wonderful day and a fabulous rest of the year. Thank you so much.